I'm very um, excited to speak with you, May, because I've obviously watched the documentary last weekend, and there's a lot to unpack. Not, uh, you know, I learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot about this chapter in Lenin or Beatles history already, but obviously hearing your version of it in this documentary, I learned I learned a lot. So um, I'm just going to dive right in because I feel like I'm looking yeah. at a quote that uh, Tony King said in where he basically said, you know, you were very young, I'm paraphrasing, but that your life was very much turned around by this lost weekend or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, it made me have a lot of empathy for you because I know you have a lot of fond memories about you know this your times in your relationship with John but at the end of the movie you are getting very emotional you're crying when you're talking about how it ended and you know so I guess I'll just start by asking you about like you know what was hard for you to process to revisit this time in your life and what made you want to do it in this film you know when you talk about um you know, it's 50 years now. It's yeah. not something that, it's not something that happened yesterday. So a lot of time has passed by, you know, and uh, uh, maturity happens. You know, I, I'm a mother now. I have two kids, kids and not kids. They're grownups. You know, they got their own lives as well. So a lot of things have come, you know, come past me. And when you see people out there writing your history, now it's time to, you know, more and more. And they're coming back and they're telling you what you were doing. And I say, that's not exactly the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, no, no, no. I read everything. And you go, no, that's not exactly how it happened. It's time. And I'm free now to be able to think, um, you know, it's more clearly, you're more removed, you're more, there's more time to process everything. And that's really where it comes down to. And, um, and, and, you know, I always believe in my guardian angels and you go with your gut, you know, I would, I started this movie, this process started six years ago, mm. five, six years ago. So it's taken up until now to actually let the world really see it. And who would have thought that we're talking 50 years? This yeah. is the anniversary. I never would have thought that. You know, I thought, oh, it would have been done sooner. It would have... No. And it was just done at the time that it was supposed to, it was meant to be. Well, well it's interesting because like I said, you know, you get emotional talking about, you know, towards the end of, of the yeah. one and a half years. And, you know, you say, you know, you have time and distance to process it. So I'm certainly not saying this is where you're coming from, but me looking at through the lens of today, I was like, damn, this would be an HR nightmare now if your bosses who are older than oh, you, 10, 10 years old in your, you know, Yoko was like 17 years 17. older than you. Yeah. And you were only 22. You were like 19 when you started for them. Obviously there's a power, if nothing else, there's a power imbalance because you're the Beatles fan who's very young. And they come to you with this kind of, you know, to quote the movie, indecent proposal, this very unusual circumstance. And, you know, you look at it through, like I said, the lens of now and, you know, a boss, be, you know, from how, you know, and correct me if I'm getting anything wrong. Uh, so okay, pretty much here, demanded yeah. that you, you know, you were reluctant. It's a weird situation. Do you look at it now? Through there's, the no lens? Two, there's no two ways about it. Yeah. I'm not going to say, uh, you know, but again, we're looking at the time period, which is the 70s which was not the same as we are now. And yep. God forbid that it is now, because I would say, you've got to be kidding me. You know, where what's what's going on? You would have a little more, um, people would be behind you and telling you that isn't the right thing. And you would just walk out and say, are you kidding me? But I also want to correct that it wasn't John so much. It was actually Yoko who approached right. me right. and because John and it was only later on when John realized he says, listen, we're not getting along. Um, and she's promoting she's pushing me into something that I wasn't going in that direction. But if you're going to keep pushing and you push them and you say, all right, fine. Um, and, you know, they, he decided he goes, I wanted to test water. So he came over to me and he, you know, yes, he kissed me. But who doesn't in that sense, you go. Why would I, why would he even be attracted to me? That's the first thought. Why really? is this man even attracted? Yeah, I never even thought that for one second. Not one second. I had been with him for three years. 
Do you think the last thing I'm thinking about is he's attracted to me? I'm not putting out those vibes. That's I just rather work, and uh, I have a security of a job. I'm learning things, you know, and that and I was happy about that. So to turn around to also and, and want this guy when she came into my office, I literally after she walked out and said, "I think you should go out with him," and I'm saying no to her. I'm crying because I'm sitting there going, what just happened? And I didn't even have my first cup of coffee yet. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, what? just what just happened? Um, and I wouldn't, in fact, I kept telling her no, and this didn't happen. She goes, I think you should. And I, we kept talking about it. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not interested. So this went on for a little bit. And so we were supposed to finish up the, you know, doing the album. We had things um john and i were supposed to be going to the studio he's canceling i only find out later that what what yoko had gone to him and said hey i fixed it for you and he's going what are you talking about and he said you fixed it for me because listen you know i fixed it so you can actually you could go out with may and he's like how do you not even like her he's like also in in disbelief at the same time so well, we're all you know do you have any insight since from what I'm getting from what you just said is, you know, John hadn't suggested or said to Yoko ever like, oh, I fancy May or anything like that. Um, why she picked you? There were other women in the orbit of Lennon and Ono that she there's no num there's obviously there were a lot of candidates she could have considered for this weird role. Right. And she picked you. I wonder, did was it because you were younger and more malleable did she not see you rock as a threat at that time although obviously later she she did but you know what was what, what do you have I, any I think insight? it's what you said that's probably that and i mean you know and i'm not and i'm not willing a participant that was not the thing i was not a willing participant she thought that she could and she kept pushing and then she's and then she pushes john on the other side which is what i found out but it's only later and I don't want to give away the story that you start seeing that there was a motive behind all this on her side of what was going on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that John even thought about me, I may, you know, you can't push John, no matter what anybody says to say, go off with this person. If he had no even understanding or liking that person or even wanting to, you know, that much of it, you know, uh, my new show of, of liking up for anyone. Um, so I guess he did like me and I had no idea, uh, never even thought about it because we would sit there and we would talk about music. We had a great conversation just in general. So to say that I, did he like me anything beyond that? That no, <laughs> you know, we had, a, we used to have a good time talking and thinking, oh, what do you like to do? What do you like to eat? You know, all the gentle stuff. And so, obviously it involved into something else. So at what point, like, as I just mentioned, um, you know, maybe she didn't see you as a long-term threat. And then at some point she did seem to regret maybe what this setup that it was coming back to, you know, bite her in the ass, basically. Uh, at what point, am I, again, correct me if I'm getting anything wrong, uh, but at what point do you think she did start to second guess this whole plan she'd put into place because she did. Yes. And she, she did. And I, and I think it was a, a months down the line. Um, she, a lot of people don't realize, but she did ask for a divorce in, in, um, in uh, 74 in February, he had to come back to New York for immigration purposes. And, um, and I, I heard, you know, that, he was going to, um, they were going to meet in the office and she was going to be there at the lawyer's office to go over things. And there she was, she wanted to tell him at the lawyer's office with other people that she wanted a divorce and she was afraid he was going to go off the deep end. And I had already heard about that, that, that it was going to happen, that she was going to do that. Um, and when he went and he came back later on, a few hours later after the meeting, uh, and then he said, I went out, I uh, went back to, to Dakota to talk to her. Everything was, and she told me, he goes, he walked into the apart our, our place and he said, 
uh, where I, we were staying at the time. And he said, well, I'm going to be a free man, you know, in, uh, in six months. And I looked at him and I said, what happened? And he said, no, she asked for a divorce. And I said, fine. And I don't think that that's the answer she was really looking for. And, uh, that and that was the the thing and he gave me a coat you know to to for for me and i said oh he goes it's winter right now we're in the midst of uh, a flux of of you know funds and yoko knew it and there's all these coats that are just sitting there and uh i just told her that you know you needed a coat and we couldn't afford it and i wanted one of them and she said on the condition that it that uh, he would tell me that it's from her. <laughs> so talk about mind games. Yeah. Wow. So that's how it's, uh, yeah. So, and well, then that was it. This went on for a few months. And then I said, whatever happened to the divorce? Right. And uh, he said, um, oh yeah. Yoko called and said, um, uh, the stars weren't right. Did you ever have a sense? Uh, well, at least in the beginning, when this weird arrangement was proposed that this would be an impermanent, like a temporary situation or, you know, did, did it feel like it was going to be a permanent relationship or what, did you always sort of have this feeling that at some point, you know, it would, the, the lost weekend would be over and John would return to Yoko. You know, yeah, I know everybody thinks that, but when he was the one that came after me, not, not Yoko saying, oh, you got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to have a fresh start. That's why we went to LA. She had no idea we were going to LA. So it was not, that's a myth. That was a misconception that, you know, that was put out there. She did not tell us to go. She didn't even know where we were. We we called her later to tell her that's where um, we were. And I took it as a day by day. I didn't want it. I didn't say it was going to end. And I knew he was going back. And I wasn't, um, it was just, let's, let's see where would this was go. Like if um, any relationship, let's see how long this would last. And I wasn't think that he was going to go back. And I don't think he even thought that either. So mm -hmm. it was a, you know, it was one of those, let's see where we're going to go. Well, when I talk about how you get emotional towards the end of the film, um, you know, as a, as a woman, we've all been ghosted or dumped or had a relationship and, abruptly or out of nowhere and you know so I think and and men too obviously but you know it seems like the way it seems in the film was that Yoko felt that as soon as she, she could snap her fingers and have him come back at any time and that's kind of how it sort of seemed she said he it's was allowed just, to it come just home seemed that way it, you know yeah, he was allowed to come home like and that. then he went but it seems like it was it, you were quite blindsided when it did all end. Like every he he said, I'll be back. And then then it was kind of over. I, my heart broke for you hearing the story, to be honest. Right. Um, thank you. I, I will tell you that. He did not expect it. That was not something that was building up. Was, oh, I'm going to go home. It because even in the beginning, she tried for months, you know, getting people to sort of run interference and say, hey, you know, if John wants to come back and he wasn't, you know, the the part I think there was one where um, I don't know if you heard that part where uh, Paul said, you know, uh, you know, he he came out to and he said, oh, if you want to go back to Yoko, you have to bring her flowers and all that stuff. And John said, I'm fine. This is our relationship took another turn and we were fine. And John May and I are together. And, you know, that was another, that was another time. And, um, and it was interesting because he had no idea that Yoko had asked Paul, would he go and deliver the message to that? If he wanted to come home, that it would be that. And, and that she actually contacted Paul for, for all of this. So it was just going down the line. Um, I know that she tried to get Aunt Mimi. Aunt Mimi wasn't also in play with that one either. She didn't want to go in the middle of all of that. So there was a lot of different, you know, um, games going on. And I think with John, he was not planning on going back. In fact, 
when he did go back, I mean, we were just planning already to go to New Orleans to, you know, meet up with Paul and Linda. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, didn't he wanted to even write with him? I know we were talking about that a few days earlier. Uh, we were about to buy a house. Mm -hmm. So those are things. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm he saying. was not, he was not aware of that either. I so, said to him, whose idea was it? It was just, I said, whose idea was this? And he goes, no one. I'll take that with a grain of salt on that one. You know, no one. Uh, it doesn't just come up out of nowhere and then say, I'm leaving. And especially in the next five years, the man like likes to make phone calls to me, to talk to me, to say, to see if I'm okay. He liked to keep... He wanted to see me. So there's a whole lot of things that were going on. It obviously could not all be fit into a film, but, you know, there were things that were more that was going on. Well, I definitely want to get into those ensuing years. But before we get to that, you know, I've actually interviewed Davy Johnston from Elton John's band and um, fairly recently, like last year. And we did talk about the famous night where, at least as rock and roll history claims, the ball sort of got rolling for the reconciliation of John and Yoko when Yoko I attended the show. I will have to disagree. Show. Well, I'd like to hear your side of the story. I'd like, because okay. the, the story that's out there is that they rekindled things when she went to the show where John performed with Elton and uh, sent flowers backstage or something. But what is your version of, because you were there. I was there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and the reason how she found out that he was going to perform was that I actually called and told her because I knew, you know, you don't hide those things. You know, people don't realize she called every day. You know, she called like up to 15 times a day. You know, the phone to hang up, she'd be calling back. She, you know, it would be over for nothing. For a year so, and a so half she did that? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and John did, you know, we saw her for her birthday that year and then you know so it wasn't like as if there was no communication there was communication and she she actually had seen us and we had uh, you know and and that was so it's not like as if it's um in new york we saw her and at one point she had came out to la to see us as well so it is that myth that nothing um that of the, the whole ball start rolling if that was the case then Here's the other thing. No, uh, why why would we um why would we be thinking about taking Julian down to um you know to Florida for for a holiday in December? We went we John and I went to see George for his uh, Dark Horse tour. Uh, Paul and Linda were over at a house, and we're thinking of buying a house in January of seventy five. So mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, it's all it's all that it's whatever the storyline goes out at that moment in time. And uh, it was just like some people have, have asked me, some fans were realized they go, doesn't make sense here. And I said, it doesn't. And if we were going to go down to see Paul and Linda down in New Orleans, that was, you know, that was them. That was just before um, he went back to the Dakota. And it there wasn't any time frame for him to go back and that was not what was happening so i'm sure you've been asked this a lot i'm sure you've asked yourself this a lot you've had 50 years to think about it but it seems again i'm saying it seems but it seems like john went back very readily as soon as he kind of got a green light from yoko to be allowed to come back home or whatever well but it was he, it was presented to him just mm -hmm. so you know that and it was presented to him that it would be better to go back to the Dakota because it was for his immigration, which okay. he was very concerned about. That's the thing that was the thing that was prevalent in his mind. Well, and she, I said, yeah, he was he was in the midst of all of that. And um, and it was coming close to getting his green card and all that stuff. And, and, and I said to him, I said, who suggested, he goes, no one. And obviously, as I say, that's not true. Um, and I said, but he said uh, to me, he said, I think, you know, it was suggested that it would be better off that, you know, it looked like I was at the Dakota 
you know, because the, the the address for whatever it is instead of where we were living, which was, you know, on the east side. And um, and that was that was why he the fear of God about losing his um uh, losing his residency in the United States was really heavy on his head. He always mm. used to get nervous because he wanted to stay. You know, he really wanted to stay. And it's not something we don't think about it because we're not looking to go to some other country and saying, I want to stay here. And we're, we're not fighting that. He's fighting to stay. And he had not left the country since 1971 at that point. Well, I'm, you and know, then, like, as I was, you know, I, basically getting at, you know, you, you sort of answered it, I guess, but like how it doesn't kind of make sense how he went back kind of on the seemingly abruptly, because as is stated in the film, he has stated in interviews how happy he was during that time. You talk about how musically productive he was during that time. Julian Lennon, who and I definitely want to get into some Julian talk. I just interviewed Julian uh, last year, actually, uh, and for his album, Jude, that just came out. And well, you I know, I took of- the picture of that that cover I, that, I, did, I did not know that but I also didn't realize how much of a friendship you still had with him which I learned one of the many things I learned about from this film it was very touching to see him in the film and in the film uh he goes on record of talking about um how happy and content his father seemed during that time it was a time when he with your help reconciled or, or you know reunited with John yeah so With all these people, including John himself, even saying, you know, this time was a a happy time in his life, a musically, creatively productive time. You know, you talk about his playful side returning after being away for a while. Like, again, I mean, I'm sure you've had time, 50 years have passed, so now you have distance, but I'm sure you had times where you were kind of like any human being would be like, why? What happened? He seemed happy. You know, have you figured it was it just the immigration thing because obviously he did have a that that played a big part in it I think when you make John a little nervous he'll make decisions at that moment you know oh god maybe that is the decision right now maybe I should do that because what people don't realize is that the last five years of his life John and I were in contact with each other yeah I we never that. we never lost that contact so it's not like as if oh Okay, and it became more complicated, you know, so as time went on. So, and I'm you do say saying, in the film that, you know, romantically things didn't really end in 75 no. either. No, it didn't. So, it's, it wasn't, it's not a, it, you know, it's not a black and white situation. There's a huge gray area. And I, you know, I think if, if people so, themselves in a position and and I'm sure everybody has their own gray area in their relationship with whoever they are you know what that means it's not you know people when you fall in love it's not oh I fell out of love I mean the man just called me out of nowhere or he would talk to friends that we had mutual friends that we knew and he would say have you seen our friend have you seen so I used to get messages all the time so it was there. It's just, I didn't put it out there. I didn't want to sit out and say, hey, I'm still talking to John. I'm still, I just sort of fled, you know, this was our relationship. And I just, he used to say, don't worry, people will know. I said, really? I said, and I didn't think about it. Did, <laughs> I would, did, I Yoko, laughing. I did said, yeah. Yoko know? Did Yoko know that you guys were still not just no. maintaining a friendship, but, you know, as you state in the film, mm-hmm. Sometimes no. it crossed that no. line into she did not know at all. I mean, no. she obviously not must know now. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, you know, I, you know what? Yes. And the whole thing was that because it was not something I, I don't think she ever thought that it was going to uh, be a, re- a real relationship. And that's really where it comes down to, because I'll tell you who told me that. And that was, um, Jerry Rubin, mm. you know, the, you know who he is. Uh, Jerry Rubin was the one of the Chicago seven because he maintained uh, a relationship with her. And, and I said, he said to me, do you ever talk to Yoko? I said, no, I haven't. Not, you know, I said, when he asked me that, I went, uh, do you? And he goes, oh yeah. And I said, okay. Um, you know, and then he just sort of volunteered. He said, you know, 
she was very surprised that your relationship really lasted more than two weeks. She thought it was only going to be a two week thing. Ooh, that's yeah. It goes back to what I was saying. Um, so, yes. Well, have have you ever? So she was the one who was more. Yeah, she was the one that was more. She didn't think it was going to go beyond where it was, and that's where it was. And she only her only she knew that John didn't expect it uh, to go back, and you know our relationship was progressing. So. Well, that's also a thing. I mean, I know he, this is, I don't remember the exact reference, but it's like a literary reference, but you know, it's the title of this film and it's, you know, it's called The Lost Weekend. And given the fact that as this film, you know, establishes, it was a lengthy and serious relationship and it's, and it was a year and a half. I've always thought the term Lost Weekend was a little bit dismissive or insulting it's sort of i mean maybe you don't feel this way but if i was in your shoes i'd be like lost weekend that makes it seem like it was a lark that it wasn't right. serious that it was or that it was even almost like a mistake or something you don't remember well because you know what i mean I, like lost weekend well here's what it comes down now he came back and he apologized for that oh. uh and one of the reasons he said that it was easier for him because people were also talking about him being drunk and, you know, waking up, how did it feel? And he didn't like to keep talking about it. So he did a lot of metaphors and references to movies because he loved the movies. So if you'd say to a, a young millennial of this day and age, you know, The Lost Weekend was a movie with Ray Milan who woke up drunk all the time, they would say, I've never heard of that movie. But for now, so the producers and directors wanted to change that narrative. Because it wasn't a lost weekend, we know that it was a lost. It's a lost weekend, a love story, and that's that's where we're changing that narrative. Yeah, I would be insulted if I went out with someone for a year and a half, and that was how it was characterized. It just yeah. makes it seem like it's a footnote in one's life or whatever. So I wondered how you felt right. about that. Have you ever a bit of a well? Now I, I could, yeah, I could feel better about it now than before. So. A bit of a loaded question, but since your relationship um, continued in one way or another as a friendship or otherwise after 1975, you know, quite tragically, he died in 1980. Um, so shockingly, uh, I imagine, have you ever wondered, could have the relate, did you ever talk about it or did you ever at least contemplate, could this relationship had been rekindled at some point if he hadn't died uh, 43 years ago almost? As you say, it's just sort of like I'm sorry, hardly believe it. But I mean, yeah. you know, five. I mean, no, five, it's, but it's it was fact. only five it's years fact. later, and you were in touch. So I imagine, since you're talking about gray area, it you know the door was still maybe at least cracked open. It was open a little bit. Yes, yeah. it was open. In fact, uh, our last conversation was that year, and it was uh, he had called me. And it was Memorial Weekend. I'm, I mean, you don't forget these things. So Memorial Weekend, and he. Um, and he, he, all he said was hello. And I knew it was his voice. And uh, I was with friends and they saw me say, I said, hey, hi, John. And they were all looking like, what? And because we had just come back in from shopping, you know, the girls. And so then they said, um, I said, yeah. He said the first words were, do you have a moment to talk? I said, sure. We talked for almost two hours, an hour and a half to two hours. And I said, where are you? And he said, Cape Town. And I went, South Africa? I mean, seriously, he goes, he goes, yeah, I just wanted to talk. I've been thinking about you and all this stuff. So he goes, I've been thinking, trying to figure out how we can catch up with one another, you know, face to face and all that. So it was there. And obviously, he lost track of time. He had almost no idea of time anymore because, you know, every day was a same day to him, Groundhog Day for, you know. And so I think if it would happen, it, it would have, it would have, it was going to happen and until obviously uh, the universe ended it for me. You know, it ended it for a lot of people, but it ended it for us in that way because our relationship never, never died. We were still going. Wow. Um, did you try to reach out to Yoko or, or to Julian after, uh, Lennon was shot. Oh, absolutely. I tried to reach out to to um to Yoko and of course that was gonna, you know, it, it hit a blank wall. I, so I left a message. 
um, Cynthia and, and I, which is Julian's mom, we really became very close friends. And that's really where um, our friendship and I would always wanted to be sure. And she knew I would always watch over to be sure Julian would be okay, no matter what, because I was always on being in the middle. I could see both sides and I knew where, what to do and to make sure, you know, to help him along. Um, speaking of lasts, you took the last photograph ever of John and Paul, right? No, yes, known yes. photograph. What? How soon was, right. or what year was that? That was. Oh, that was in 74. That okay. was in 74. And then we were doing the uh, Harry Nielsen album out in LA. And that's, that's where that came in from. Because obviously, you know, when you talk about when you so eloquently put it as the universe ended it for you, obviously John's tragic death the universe ended any hope of a reconciliation professionally with the Beatles, you know? So well, that photo holds a lot yeah. of weight. That photo holds a lot of weight, you know, in Beatle lore. In Beatle, right. I, I, I will only say I was very happy that I was able to have, uh, have Paul and Linda over as our guests at our apartment in New York all the time. We were always, they were always there. Uh, when uh, also George, George Harrison, and we were there and, you know, John said, if you need my help on his lat on his only good uh, dark horse tour, we said, we'll help you out. John said, I'll be there for you no matter what. And, you know, so there was a lot of fences mended and including Cynthia, because I remember saying to my, to me, you know, thinking I wanted to be sure that they mended because they had never had closure to their own relationship and uh and I thought it was really good because as Julian started to come over Cynthia felt better at the fact that you know he can come over uh and not feel bad and she could make a phone call to talk to Julian and John wasn't going to get all bent out of shape and which he was at one point and you know before the first visit he, he would say oh I wish Cynthia wasn't coming I said I would tell him, I said, sorry. I said, you haven't seen your son in several years. She has all the rights. And until you mend that fence, it's not going to change. And they mended the fence. They got the closure that, I mean, because they hadn't seen each other. They got the closure they needed and everything then worked out. So when he, she would call, he would pick up the phone. He didn't have that angst about, oh, the ex-wife, you know, what was going mm. on. And, and it was, it was fine. You know, and, all, and he and, was, he, go ahead. No, I was just because obviously, as we see in the film, uh, the connection you have with Julian almost, well, 50 years later is still so, yeah. so strong. It's very sweet to see that. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And I, and I'm, and I'm glad that I could be around to help him out or give him some extra memory that he might've forgotten from back then. Um, yeah, I'm always known in the circle like, oh, you're you're looking for info. Talk to May. She remembers everything. It's only because I was the most super straight person. I was actually called by someone that I was like Miss Goody Two Shoes, you know, because I didn't drink, smoke, take drugs, you know. And I'm like, you know, my my favorite drug of choice, bottle of Coca Cola, you know, is <laughs> that was my thing. So if you see bottles and pictures, you see Coca Cola on the table. It's all mine. Did it bother you that John was, you know, as we characterize this as the lost weekend, that he he was doing a lot of alcohol and drugs around you, I imagine? Not really. That's the oh. whole myth. It mm -hmm. wasn't. It's like the few times that he's out with the boys or with people, of course. And if you read, it's all the same three past incidences and that's it. And then, you know, um, he didn't do a lot of drugs because, you know, we did so much work. You know, he made... He had uh, he had not a whole lot. It's only when people came around, and I hated that. You know, I hated that whole uh, drug, and he knew it. The so Hollywood vampires, sort of said, okay. the Hollywood vampires. vampires. So that was that was a later. That was really uh, more of something that got created later. Because in the early part, John would come in, and he met um, Alice and and Mickey Dolans and Harry, but we weren't there all the time. We would we would always come back to New York in between and everything, and we weren't always out in the clubs. You only saw us a couple of times, and that those are the times you catch us, and that was it. 
And as uh, John would say, whenever he went out with Harry, there was always a problem. And I would always say, it's a good copy. Is it Harry or is it John that you want on your cover? So we know who made the cover. You do mention in the film that, I mean, maybe it wasn't a common thing, but there were at least a couple of incidences where John yeah. was abusive, physically abusive. Was that tr uh, fueled by him being in an inebriated state? At oh, yeah, it was never it was not any. And the, the abuse that I received was not like he punched me out. It was more that's all more exaggerated than it is. I mean, he yes, he shoved me. Uh, uh, he pulled my hair, but yes, he was an inebriated. When you're with Phil Spector, good gracious, and you know you never know what you, you come up with. Um, I used to have the fights with with Phil. He was not an easy person. He was. Oh, um, oh no, <laughs> I know. Uh, loaded question on that, right? And loaded answer. He mm -hmm. was not easy, but he he and I fought a lot because I didn't. He couldn't give me anything to calm me. I didn't take the drugs. I didn't drink. So at one point, I think um, he wanted John to go somewhere. And I said, I want to get in the car. And he said, no, he goes, you're not coming with us. I said, I want to go. And he said, no. And I wouldn't, I refused to move. So he had his bodyguard actually physically lift me. And this is Phil me. Spector you're talking about did this. Yes. And this is Phil Spector. So this was not uh, something that, you know, I don't know how many girls would have, uh, gone in that direction most of them would have you know had a good time I wasn't about to I was going to protect what what was happening because John didn't see himself except hanging out with the boys you know because he didn't get a chance to do that so this is back in his early days of Hamburg and early days of Liverpool and I'm sitting there going he forgot I remember we were already, he was telling me something he was angry at something and we were on the boulevard of, um, you know, sunset. And I said, and I dragged him and he says, what? He goes, I said, we can't stand on the street corner and you yelling something that how much you don't like this person because there are press people. So he forget where, you know, what was happening. So, you know, so I said, you can't do that. So, so I drag him off. We've talked about, you know, how, the relationship ended by John's choice, but were there ever moments during this year and a half where you considered leaving or left because you were in over your head? You didn't like this scene or, or anything like that. It, you know what, in that sense, John didn't want it because he actually said it later. It was just the matter of whatever was, I, as I said before about him uh, with his, his immigration because uh when I saw him in the last five years it was like he goes I really you know you know it's it, it's tough to even say but you know he he would turn around and he says I wish we could go you know go to sleep and wake up and still be here in the same you know together and so this was said you know and I said well right now it's not possible. And he said, yeah, but I'm going to see what I, you know, in, in his mind, he says, we'll just, we'll take it one way. You know, we'll see where, we're, where it's going to go. You know, so it was not an end. Our relationship hadn't ended. And like I said, the universe took care of that one. How long did it take you to get over this? If, if you have, because it, obviously you were young, you were impressionable. It was an intense relationship that didn't have closure uh because right. of the because of the universe and because of the fact that you know as you've made as you said like you still had were in touch or whatever and i don't know how often you saw him or how often you were intimate Quite or often. whatever it was often I mean, okay we, yeah so i mean um, you obviously moved on with your life you you married you had children and stuff but like imagine it wasn't hard to move on i mean imagine it was not easy to move on it would not have been easy for me to move on from something like this to be honest it wasn't easy and it's still you're right. You don't have closure. I, I don't have closure. And so, but I have to do something. I can't sit there and mourn for the rest of my life on that, you know? So you got to do something. And uh, you have him in, in a special part of your life here, you know, and or in your heart. And, and you say, okay, 
just guide me to the next level. You know, you, you can't, you can't sit there. Did you ever regret, um, you know, getting into this relationship? Obviously you had a lot of wonderful times and memories, but did you ever think perhaps it was a mistake to, to get into this unusual situation? It started as a very unusual situation at least. Right. I don't think you can't have regrets. You can only learn. Um, I was meant to obviously go into this space somehow. Um, and, um, you know, you just, you can't have regrets. And if you have regrets, then, then it, it doesn't, then you haven't learned anything. How could you go into a relationship and still say, Hey, I, I shouldn't have done this. I did it. So now I have to own up to that and figure out where my next steps are. And right now I have two wonderful kids. And you know what? My daughter's getting married. I'm thrilled. Yes, thank you. And um, I am thrilled. Thank you. And um, I'm just, I'm happy. I mean, I would like to see if there is another partner out there. That's not easy. That part's not easy. No, uh, I'm sorry. To, you know, I don't, didn't mean to make you cry or anything like that. I mean, no, 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 it's okay. It's still emotional. It's still raw. Yeah. People don't understand that that's, yeah. it's not, um, you know, cause people say, oh yeah, sure. You know, they don't understand. There was so much intricacies in this relationship. Um, and we were under the eye of everyone out there. You know, you, you talk about every fan. So when they come up to you and they go, I know everything about you, but you don't, you don't yeah. know my, the, the things that I sit there with, you know, with him on and we talk. You're not in my my bedroom. You're not in my my you know whatever it is that we're in our, our creative little place to to do this. But yeah. it's it also it's, it's he's human. He was human, and that's what I want people to see. He was not a Superman. He was human, and he had a lot of uh, frailties. He had a lot of problems like you and me, and you know he had different problems. You know, and um, he was he was insecure, which mm -hmm. a lot of people would find interesting. He was insecure in certain things that he did in life, you know, and he tried to make them better as he grew older. And, you know, he was hoping that that's, you know, yeah. life. Well, you were talking about, you know, fans and how they claim to know the story or know about you and stuff. So many Beatles fans have, you know, quite famously been really hateful to Yoko. And in my opinion, you know, despite obviously her not being a perfect person herself, I think very, un, you know, quite unfair to Yoko, you know, with the, their accusation. It became like an adjective, a verb and a noun to be like, oh, she's a Yoko or whatever. Like she's the person that breaks up the band. People, you know, we don't need to talk about that. But yeah. The, yeah. Fand the Beatles fandom, which is very intense. What is their general assessment of you? Have they been kind to you uh, or, or, or do they treat you in a similar kind of vilifying way? No, I am um, not really. I've really had it. Uh, I've, been, I've had a lot of support, actually. Because um, the movie does open are... with sort of, sorry to interrupt, but the movie does actually open in like the first couple of minutes with an archival interview you're doing where someone is talking about how you have been possibly accused of exploiting this era, this oh, yes. era of your life or whatever. So that's why I asked. But that was, I I think it was a, a Geraldo. And, and okay, then, well, there you, go. you know, for whatever Geraldo. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you know where that's coming from. <laughs> um, on the, on the general, general, I would say it's not a hundred percent, but I would say like 90% of the people that I've met have, have been absolutely um, really sweet about it, you know, and they've been kind to me and they haven't given me that, that um, what Yoko had gotten. And, you know, and I, whatever goes on with her situation is whatever people have with how they perceive it. And yet, and I have that other 10% of people coming at me at the same time and they want to believe whatever they want to believe. So, I can only do so much. I'm as human as the next person. And you can only do 
what's out there and and tell your story. And, you know, we all have our um, moments, you know, like you do too, you know, your, your life and you have, uh, and I love your, your outfit, your look, and somebody else may say, I hate it. You know, that's that's their problem. Right. It's exactly it. I can't, I can't control uh, everybody's, you know, their feelings. I can only control, I, it's that line that I'm learning more and more. I can only control what I can control. I can't control anybody else. How do you feel about the term groupie, which is a term that I oh. imagine, well, honestly, that term gets applied to any woman who dates a rock star. It gets applied to women who marry rock stars. It's kind of a- yeah, It's overused. Yeah. It's an overused uh, word. I don't, I imagine it has at times been used to describe you uh uh not that often but uh yeah i mean not that often only because i was people had seen me working and i worked for them and that was where most a lot of people knew me when i was doing the work i was working for them for three years because any of this stuff started happening so you know it's not something that uh they saw me out there with speaking of working in that world this just i read bad fingers biography the without you it's out of print uh but i read it when it came out maybe 20 years ago or so and i seem to is day after day was that written partially about you the i feel like Uh, you have a connection to that so yeah i i well i worked at apple they were that it was like one of the first band to uh, uh, come to new york and i was very close to all of them and i did date uh so everybody what is it? Transparency on that. Yeah. With, uh, with Pete Ham for a short time, but we always remained friends. Mm-hmm. A- and um, I would always like to help this band wherever they were going. You know, they were the first yeah. ones coming in. And what was sad to me was I saw uh, Tommy and Pete uh, in 75 and I went to England and I remember saying to them, Hey, listen guys, like before, because Tommy would always say to me, the bass player was always saying, oh, but you're so famous. I said, would you stop that nonsense? We're still friends. I don't know what, you know, stop that nonsense. Uh, I said, but if you need my help in any way, like we did before, I'm always there to help you out. And it was just a weird moment. And um, so I I got home and I remember being, uh, saying, I think I need to leave London. And I, went in the next day to the Apple offices and I said to my friends and I said, you know, I think I'm going to leave. They said, why don't you wait to the weekend? We can go party. We could do, I said, I can't, there's something that's telling me I got to leave now. And they said, now I said, well, I said, and I started thinking, I said, well, today's Tuesday. I'll give myself a day to get myself ready. I'm leaving Thursday. Well, the angels were watching out after me because that was the morning that Pete had died. Wow. So, wow. so had I called and I, the only reason I didn't call him, cause I used to say, oh, musicians don't wake up early. And I think it's still true. Uh, I just sort of said, okay, I, I, I said, oh, I'll talk to them when I get back to New York. And, wow. um, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. It was just such, yeah. it was such a shock when I got back to New York, I got the phone call. And uh, I was I was told and I was just totally blown away by that. Yeah, it was I mean, that's a whole tragic story uh, uh, separate from what we're talking about. Here. Uh, yeah, I anything see- else. Yeah, I seem to recall so. in the book that the line in uh, day after day that I remember finding out about you was maybe about Pete finding out about you and John or something like that. But I'm only remembering it from a book I read a long time ago. So I probably and could have. I'm going to. I I don't know. Personally, okay. I don't know. Okay. So, so that, you know, there was a lot of things. I, I think somebody, uh, Dan um, Matovina, I think what wrote, is that the one that wrote the book? And then, and um, I remember someone's, um, he was saying to me, oh, well, I think there's a, a, a thing called Maze Blues or whatever it was about me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm only finding these things out now. I don't have a clue because I, you- I, you know, I don't know. John really definitely don't. wrote at least one song about you, right? To go back oh, to John. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, he wrote, uh, what was it? Surprise, Surprise, Sweet Bird of Paradox. 
And um, I remember him saying to me, come into, come into the office. And I said, okay. And then he made me sit in front of him. And he said, just sit there. And then he picked up the guitar and he did a verse. And, you know, he hadn't finished his song, but he goes, I just wrote this. And he goes, for you. And I'm like, and I'm sitting there like dumbfounded with it. Like, what, what? Me? You know, how did that happen? So in my head, I couldn't, you know, it was, it was just kind of a surprise. I remember, uh, you know, that whole, that whole thing, you know? Wow. So it was, uh, it was kind of, it was very sweet night. And, and of course I sing on number nine dream. That was the other one. So, you know, the first song that was written on the, for that album was mine. And the last song that was ever written for that album is number nine dream. And we're one right after the other. So, yeah. So you, are you at peace basically with your place in, pop pop culture history because you know when you are part of i mean you know everyone wants to be has claimed to be the fifth beetle the sixth beetle whatever like when you're part of the beatles world yes you know you're going to go down in history and and you know you are for something that is very personal and also happened a very long time ago um are you at peace with that especially after having like did making this movie bring you any peace it sure, sure did. And, you know, it's because it's 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 time that, you know, I told my story coming out of my mouth as a me doing the narrative as opposed to somebody else saying it. You know, um, I had no idea I was going to actually be the the narrator to my own story. You know, you always think, oh, it's somebody else. No, it was me. But um, yes, I, I am. I am at peace. Um, you know, you're never 100 percent. You always have that two percent somewhere saying I should really have done this and you know whatever it may be but again it's like what John says you know you whatever it is you'll come back and you just pick yourself up and you, you just sort of you go along but at least now 50 years later people will have seen this um and answer a lot of questions that like you said you didn't even know and it's and it brings me a little bit more at at ease instead of people saying well, did you did you know Julian? I mean, I've had people actually yeah. ask me that. Or oh, have I ever met the other Beatles? That's the other one. Did, so I know. Where's, well, obviously, where's that other? You said two. There's the two percent. May I ask you, what's that two percent when you say maybe I should have done this or that? There are probably things that I I didn't get all into the movie. You know, you you can only give ninety minutes of it. So whatever it is, uh, 96 minutes, and you can't do your whole life because somebody, because so, some people say, well, you didn't uh, address this so you didn't do that. You can't do everything. So there may be that 2% that's, that's it. But you're also nitpicking. I let the producers, directors do the movie. I did not sit there and say, okay, let's do, I did not micromanage them at all. I let them, I let them do, shape it do the whole thing. They heard my story. They worked out the whole thing. Cause I don't think it's, um, you know, if you're doing it, then it's only, it's closed mind. Cause they may, people may see it differently. I want somebody that if they're from the outside coming from the inside, you may want this. And they may say, I don't get what that means. You know, this way we could, we could go this route. I understand this better. You know, it's any, it's any movie. It's the, storytelling which is the better route it's not always the person that is involved has the better route is there any you know you talk about you've repeatedly said it was so important for you to you know tell your story your way uh, was there yeah. any one or it could be more than one what were the main things you wanted to set the record straight on with this film that you achieved by making i it? think uh in this case uh the achievement is that, you know, that John and I uh, really cared for each other, um, that they were still, uh, that we were still in touch with one another, even to the very end. We had all, and all the, the music, that there was so much love that we, that, you know, um, I foster all the, 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 the love that he had for his music, and I wanted him to be that be there I, and when you talk about a lot of the, the different areas we saw the ufo together we uh last john and paul photo um you saw a ufo Harrison. together yes and I'm it's sorry. on the album 
walls and bridges at the bottom and says, I saw a UFO at nine o'clock on August 23rd, 1974. So there's a lot of little things. So um, when we went to the Statue of Liberty, those pictures of John on the Statue of Liberty, that's, that's, um, I was there with him. So there's a lot of people, the myth of where I was, I was with him. So with, uh, with John, there was also, he gave uh, a song, they wrote uh, Bowie's first number one, Fame. Mm -hmm. I was there for that. Oh, um, wow. You know, yeah. In the studio so, when they recorded it? Yeah, I was um, not recording when they were writing it. Because, um, cause, yes, because Bowie had asked us to come down because he was mixing, uh, what was it, Across the Universe. And and it was on for his Young Americans album and all that stuff. And we were down there. And John turns to to Carlos and he says, oh, yeah, I had this riff in my head. And uh, it's from Shame, 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 which is Shirley and Company. And he says, I love this riff. And he goes, I would love to do something from that riff. And next thing you know, we're in another, you know, we went to the guest lounge and they were working out. And Bowie comes in and says, I've been looking for you guys for the last you know, 45 minutes. He had no idea where we had gone to. We had disappeared. And he said, yeah, we've been here. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, right. You know, he goes, we're working on a, on a riff on a song. And uh, it was um, shame, shame, shame. He goes, wow. well, he goes, do you have any lyrics? And he's, John says, no. He goes, do you mind if I do something? He says, no. So 25 minutes later, he comes back and he's got fame. Wow. Well, there's obviously so much more I could ask you, but you know, you've been so generous with your time. I encourage people to watch the actual documentary last weekend to get more of the story in your own words. But the last thing I do want to ask you, I mean, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this. I know you and Yoko did not stay in touch. I have read that you did have a random encounter in Iceland about 15 yes. or so years ago, but you know, she's getting yes. up there in age. Yes. Is there any closure you want to have with her? Because, you know, you guys did start off with some kind of friendship that sort of got awkward, I guess, is one way to yes, put it. Yes, I would say. Uh, you know what? I I don't know if I think the closure has been from the past already. There's nothing in this day where she is and that she's not. Um, I know she's been very ill that if I said anything that she would even know it. So you know what it's wherever we last left it i think that's where it's it will stay and how did you yeah. last leave it would you say we just said hello and and that was it and you know when we were in iceland that was really funny you know she she i went over to her and i said um hello how are you and she says i'm fine and yeah there was not much more than that cuz she was busy doing at that point it was the um the songwriting competition that was the first one in in Iceland and it and it really made me laugh because I said I know John you're doing this because all this happened on John's birthday oh wow on October 9th well, I'm was... on my way to Liverpool and she was doing the thing in Iceland there's the universe again I guess universe yes. is, is so... mysterious in many ways well um thank you for this really interesting fascinating conversation thank you for the the film as well. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I hate, do you know if Yoko is aware of this film? Obviously you did a book in like 83 or so. Yeah. I mean so she obviously knows uh, something, I'm, you know, cause that was back in 83. So yeah. it was always there. Um, and I also did the, the Instamatic Karma, which was the photographs. And that was, you know, she was still around for that. And um, I'm sure, you know, she knows she, whatever it is, she would know what's going on it's nothing I, now it's on celluloid type in the sense digital I mean, yeah i'm not trying to harp on it just that you know she has a narrative that she wants to maintain of what her relationship and her marriage was like and yeah. i don't know if she's and you she's have done your own, several no she's yeah. done several yeah and i and i don't know if I, she'd be cool with you know your version which is completely as legitimate and as valid and into your lived experience, your truth, if she'd be okay right. with you putting I don't know, like but this. you know what? She never said anything back then, really. Cool. Um, and you know, and that's really what it is. And she she's never said a word about when my book came out or anything really. So what what more can I say? Um, after all these years.
that's where it is. You said it in the film and it's your story is fascinating and I'm glad you had the opportunity and the bravery to tell it and uh, both on film and book and with me. So um, I want to thank you for your time and I would encourage everybody watching this interview to uh, or reading this interview to see the film. Thank you for inviting me to have this conversation. It's great. Thank you, man. I'm glad we sort of had this matching color scheme going. I think the universe (laughs) made that happen as well.